So today's speaker is Konstantin, who has been at eFISC for uh, quite some time. So he doesn't really need an introduction, I think. And the topic for today is when is a network tree like and how does it help in exploring dynamics? So Konstantin, go ahead. Right. Thank you, Tobias. It's a pleasure. And first of all, I would uh, like to ask you to interrupt me anytime um, with questions. Um, just to stay in context and make this more lively, perhaps. Um, so often these questions also help others to, to follow a bit better. So I, I remember uh, the first IFISC, or actually back then, IMEDEA seminar I gave was uh, 20 years ago. And there was, um, so there were a lot of questions. Um, probably also because I didn't explain everything very well. So I guess I was interrupted uh, at least once per transparency. <laughs> there was also real transparencies in a real uh, sala de actas. And um, so I'm, I try to explain things better today, but I'm also challenging you to, to beat that record of uh, one interruption <laughs> per slide. All right, with this, uh, let, let me start. So um, what I would like to do is the statistical mechanics of the easing model on a network. Um, so up front, this maybe even looks like a, like a homework in one of the master's courses on networks or on uh, computational methods. Um, so everything is pretty, um, pretty standard here. So you have the, uh, the uh, easing model Hamiltonian without field. Okay. Um, and uh, I'm, so the homework task would be to, to uh, for instance, evaluate the partition function for some value of beta or maybe equivalently compute the density of states, the histogram of, of energies over the whole state space. And then this is the, the Laplace transform of that, right? The, so anyway, yes, you want to, you want to do statistical mechanics uh, on, on a given network and maybe getting hold of the partition function is the best thing to do first. So we'll focus a little bit on that. Um, yes, and the network can be any network. So you can have in mind, for instance, this often used example of the Karate Club network because it's nice and handy. So it has it's depicted here and has 34 nodes that max uh, two to the power of 34 around 10 to the power of 10 spin states. Um, and now if you do this homework brute force, so you just write uh, a program that really enumerates all the uh, all these states then and you can do one million per second then it will take a few hours so, okay so this is still doable but not very satisfactory I, I should also say that i don't want uh, any stochastic methods here i want something that well that's maybe approximate even though i will go into exact numbers in the end but I also wanted to rep be reproducible and perhaps with a, some kind of bound on the, uh, on the error if I do any approximations at all. <clears throat> now I have on my screen some strange lines here that if you also see them, so they are not part of my slides. Something strange is happening here now. <laughs> Zoom. Um, Good. Um, so the most standard approaches that you maybe learn first when you get started with the easing model, they would be to exploit some structural symmetry. So for instance, when you have transla translation invariance on a, on a lattice, think of a square lattice where we actually have an exact solution also. Then of course, taking an infinite size limit helps and also taking um, ensemble averages, for instance, over a random graph ensemble uh, also 
makes things easier. But none of these three is actually applicable in our case hmm? because we have one finite network not part of an uh, ensemble and we can't take the uh, the thermodynamic limit of the of the karate club so it's really just this this network here so but what we so we have to exploit something else if we don't want to fully enumerate the state space and um, um, the thing that is typically in common to all the practical cases, to all the real world networks, or most of the real world networks that we might be interested in is that they are sparse, so that they are, um, <clears throat> that they have about as many uh, links as nodes. Whereas in, in theory, the, I mean, the maximum number of links scales with the square of the, of the number of nodes because you have all the pairs. Good, so we can uh, then, in trying to do that, we can actually focus on the sparsest connected, connected networks. And these are trees and um, there things are easy to do exact. Um, in fact, things become a bit trivial then, but anyway, let's, uh, let's go through this. So the uh, solution of the easing model on a tree recursive. Solution. Okay, so let's take this tree here, and um, its partition function value for a given beta, well, is uh, is the sum of uh, of two terms, namely, when I fix uh, one of the spins, and let's say at this node here, which I would call the root, kind of the center of the tree, but you can choose any. Um, then it's uh, it's a partition function of this system where this uh, this spin has been fixed to be up, plus the partition function of that system where that spin has been fixed to point down. And um, well, what's the what's the benefit now? Well, the, actually, this system here with that uh, spin fixed is now disconnected into three parts. Yeah, because these, this subtree, this subtree, which is actually one, just one node with its edge here, and this subtree, they they don't have anything in common. So we can just write this as the partition function of three non-interacting systems. So the, the the product. Okay, and you see where where this is going now. I can again evaluate each part here in this recursion. This part, the middle part, is actually particularly simple because that's, uh, you can write it down directly. So we've kind of reached the end of the base case of your recursion, which is just one, uh, one edge, one, one interaction between two nodes. And for the rest, I can start the, the recursion again. Okay. The result then is a bit sobering because in fact, it doesn't depend on which tree you use. The, the only thing that matters is how many uh, nodes is it has so this is exactly the partition function also of the of just a chain so it doesn't really matter if it branches or not right good um but this is not what we can use for the karate club network or any other real world network of interest well unless it is a tree but most are not um um, but anyway, it's used as a as the basis for a computational method, um, namely tree-like approximation, where you just pretend you sit in one node and you just pretend that the, the network is a tree. All right. So this computation here, so I'll fix this spin and collect all the collect the information from the uh, from the neighbors. And then fix it in the opposite direction and collect that information in the from the neighbors and uh, do all the sums and products correctly on the assumption that I am on a tree. You can still do that, uh, even though the network is not a tree, right? So that's just um, you kind of stop stop wandering and just say, okay, we can we can do things on a tree. So let's pretend that our network is a tree. 
And these methods, they are then also called belief propagation because you're not actually uh, transmitting any real values or any exact values from one node to another. You just kind of uh, transmit the belief, which is again based on some estimates. Um, and yeah, it has some other names also, um, cavity method, for instance. Good. Um, so here's a picture of that. So for instance, uh, node one asks uh, the current estimate from node two and node two now asks all the neighbors except, um, except node one itself, no? because we shouldn't send things back and forth. Con Constantine, I think there's a question. Yes. Yes. Ah, okay. Ernesto, Ernesto, I saw your hand. Was that the hand or? Yeah, no, I, I, I just very simple question. So in the previous sure. slide that you have, uh, so expression three here mm -hmm. uh, is only true in the case of a tree, because in the case of the tree, which is a bipartite graph, so the hyperbolic sign is equal to zero, but this is no longer true if you have cycles. So how, how do you manage with this kind of cycle containing of graphs in the in what you are going to explain now yes here the assumption is just uh, that, that it is a tree i'm doing the whole thing on a on a tree right i will, i think i will get to this in a <laughs> in a moment so if i can go back to, so you agree with this as long as we're just looking at trees right oops sorry Ernesto? Yes, that's right. So if it is a tree, that's true, absolutely. Because yeah. this sum here is the exponential of, uh, okay, so it is true in the case of a tree, okay. Right, and well, and otherwise, well, I'll come to this and otherwise it also turns out we, we don't know in general, so <laughs> because it's not always solvable, so. Um, Okay, so yes, and then one thing, maybe that's also part of the answer to your comment or question. Um, now, if now we're using this, um, this information processing, assuming that we are on a tree, even though we, not, we might not be, right? So there might actually be here. So I, the network continues over here. There might actually be from the, some node down here might be a connection to some node up here or even shorter. I mean, we're, uh, we might even use this on networks with pretty short loops, even maybe triangles. So there might also be a connection from one to, um, to three here. So then when things are cycling around um, and, we keep, and we are actually working with the partition function then things are bound to go wrong because then uh, they can actually diverge, right? So maybe this is also what the background of your, um, of your question. We keep adding and multiplying and adding and multiplying. Um, so um, things will not necessarily or in, in uh, and almost none of the cases, uh, things can be expected to converge when we are trying, when we are, trying to have this B as an estimate of the partition function. So when, so in fact, when you do this belief propagation here, we have to find some, some other quantities that are bounded. For instance, um, uh, the probability that two spins are in the same state. So the probabilities are bounded. So then you, at least you don't have this problem with, with divergence, okay? So it can, it can be a bit, tricky and uh, it's better not to do it exactly with a partition function, but with uh, something else that characterizes the, uh, the equilibrium state here. Okay, so there was a recent um, publication um, coming with the, an innovation on this type of algorithm. So this spring in science, science advances by Kirkley, Cantwell and Newman, so the, the networks. Mark Newman, and um, so what they do is, okay, they do this belief propagation and then as an extension, um, they also take um, 
a certain take into account a certain amount of short loops okay short cycles so exactly these objects that that violate the tree condition <clears throat> so for for a, for a certain specific class of networks that have kind of only loops locally around uh, around nodes uh, that algorithm is actually exact um, and here's a here's now their result on a um, on an empirical network which is not the karate club network which is a um, 500 nodes uh, power uh, and some electric um, network that otherwise I haven't seen so much, but they chose this one. Um, and they calculate the, the entropy and the specific heat as a function of the, of the temperature. And um, oops, and they compare this to the approximate true value to the unbiased value, which they get from Markov chain Monte Carlo. So it's a bit difficult to see, but the black curves are the, um, are the Markov chain Monte Carlo. So the approximated or the, the sampled truth and uh, the red ones are the, um, the original belief propagation. And then you have various degrees of approximation of loop approximation here. And up here is the entropy as a function of temperature. And um, that works pretty fine. So the, all the curves are actually close together. One can't even see if this, um, this extra loop uh, terms, whether they, whether they give any improvement. It's, it's hard to see, <laughs> but probably it is. Um, but the, the problem is here when they try to, or when they, when they do um, calculate the specific heat, um, curves tend to be closer to the assumed true value here, which is the def dashed uh, black curve when, when they take into account more loops, but, but still things seem to kind of run unstable, right? So we have here some, um, uh, some discontinuities. And uh, so it doesn't, uh, it still doesn't do the, um, the job that we want. And if you look at the, the network, it is actually pretty tree-like. So most of the nodes actually are on, um, are on trees, so to speak. So they are kind of on trees that are dangling away from the, um, from the core, which then does, does contain some, some loops. <clears throat> okay. So I came across this. I had also been trying to, um, to do um, belief propagation with proper bookkeeping of um, um, which terms actually do arise from some loops, etc. And uh, so this is uh, on the one hand progress because in principle the curves are the larger R is are closer to the to the to the true one. Uh, but on the other hand, this doesn't doesn't always converge properly, it seems. Um, so yeah, what to do now was a big uh, um for me for some time. And then I, they, I started to give up on, uh, on trying to improve uh, belief propagation and just start an, um, start an alternative approach where I thought, okay, let's, uh, let's try to, or let's not try to improve uh, the, the approximation that we already made by assuming that things are a tree, but let's try to, uh, to get more classes of graphs where we can do the exact computation. And what I, what I mean by allowing for exact computation is of course in practical terms, right? I can always, enumerate the whole state space, but uh, then for uh, for larger number of nodes, um, this this becomes uh, infeasible because it just takes too long. So this is kind of uh, 
not very exact <laughs> uh, requirement, so to speak. What uh, what does it mean to allow for exact computation, but in a reasonable in a reasonable computer time? Okay. And then you can actually look at uh, computational graph theory and how problems are solved there. For instance, the, the coloring of of uh, of graphs, etc. And there's one concept or a set of concepts. Um, that is successful and is actually also a generalization of uh, of having a tree, and that is k trees and partial k trees, uh, caudal graphs and and tree decomposition. So I will not uh, I will not go into these now, but just um, explain in principle by increasing more complicated examples how you can uh, how you can actually on networks with loops. Um, get an exact result. Good. So let's uh, let's kind of uh, start from from scratch here. Um, disregard um, tree-like approximation and belief propagation altogether. Uh, now everything is back to to exact. Okay. So for a um, for one for a one edge system. Well, these are the these are the states and uh, the four states, and um, these are the values of the partition function when I quench these states and when I sum them up, um, then then I have a partition function of the of the system, which is this cosine hyperbolic term. Now, when I have a a path or a chain uh, of nodes. Um, I can just first of all assign each of I can kind of uh, consider each uh, uh, each edge again independently and assign each of them such a such a table okay and then I could uh, at once combine all the tables into one right so the the z values there are they always have to be multiplied so I get some different exponential function values of beta here, and I would have to sum that up. So that would be the brute force approach of just going through all the, all the states of the system. Of course, I, uh, what I realize as I keep combining these, or as I combine these tables is that um, I can also do the summation over sigma one first before I combine this table with the with the next one because sigma one doesn't appear anywhere else here, right? So if this spin doesn't direct is is only uh, interacting with this one, sigma one is only interacting with sigma two. I can already sum it out. Okay, so then I have a smaller table here, and um, I combine it with the table for the next link. I get this one. Now I can do the same again. I've already taken care of everything up up here. So sigma, sigma two doesn't appear in any other table that I should still multiply in here. So I can just sum it out um, and so on and so forth until I reach the point where only sigma five is left. And then I sum over sigma five in the end and, and get the result for this, for this path. Okay, that's for a, so for a path, so something even less sophisticated than the trees that we already uh, master. Uh, now comes the, the thing with one loop, but now you see it's actually uh, uh, in this setting here, no complication at all. Um, I just now make the, uh, this extra edge that now forms the loop on this path. Um, okay, so node two has an extra edge and uh, that's just taken into account by assigning it now this table and of course the correct set entries here. Okay, so this is like a, in this case, like a, um, a star. I mean, no, no two with all its downstream neighbors. So that would be more if two had also a connection with five, then it would be also a star with two as a center and three, four and five as, as leaves. And I can just do the same thing again. So sum out sigma one, then 
uh, combine this table with that one. Uh, now I <clears throat> now I can again sum out sigma two, and I'm just left now with with a table that has one more row because I'm already I've already hit something that that interacts with node four, right? So, but I can still handle it. So, <laughs> and uh, so um, the rest of the of the matter just just goes as I had it. Okay. Now. Um, you could already say, okay, then let's arrange all the nodes of the network in a path and, uh, and apply the, the same thing, right? So the network itself is not a path, but I just put it, uh, just try to find a path that involves all the nodes of the network and the rest of the connections, they are just these loops over the path, kind of along the path. So that would actually work, but uh, probably even with the Karate Club network, then you would still get a lot of uh, spins to consider at the same time. So now comes the thing that we can generalize this path plus loop to tree plus, plus loop. And um, now jump directly into the, to the main concept here, which is now tree decomposition. And without really formalizing it, tree decomposition means that I arrange the nodes of my network. So these are now the 34 nodes of the Karate Club network in a tree such that all the edges, all the links of the network, they are parallel to the tree. What does that mean? That means that, uh, okay, I've cho chosen a route and all the links of the network um, they have to go along a path um, that is coming from the from the route. Okay, so for instance, uh, number seven uh, can uh, is allowed to connect to number five because well, this is the path from number seven to to the root, right? So number five is between root and number seven on the, on the tree. And so this path is allowed, but uh, once I've chosen this tree here, number seven may not connect to number 13, okay? Because neither is number seven on the path from 13 to root nor vice versa. So um, I would have a, if I now try to apply this, concept here with uh, going through such chains and combining my partition function tables, then I would have a problem if I, uh, if there was a, this kind of cross edge here, right? If some, suddenly something appears that is actually not downstream uh, on my way to the, to the root of the, of the tree. Okay, is that, uh, is that kind of clear? Or any questions at this point? By the way, I can't see the, um, if you if you say raise hand in the Zoom tool, I I don't think I can I can see that at least not for for all of you. So you, if you have a question, just switch on the microphone and, and ask. If you raise your hand, I think I will see it. But okay, all, good. I hope all, I all that. Yes. <laughs> but it's also fine with me just to just to speak up. <laughs> good. <coughs> Um, yeah, so now I, I won't go into the, into the algorithm anymore. I, I think I've given you kind of hint how this works on a chain and now we have to, you have to kind of accept that it also works on, a, on, on this tree, right? So this, the result now, for instance, after I've completed this path here and arrive at node one has to be combined again with the results uh, from all this stuff up here and from here, and then I can go down here and, and so on. So it's, it's again, a kind of recursive algorithm, but yeah, transporting more than one node information um, every time. So how, how much information is it actually, or how, how broad are our tables, how many rows are there in the tables? Well, that's uh, why it's, it's drawn in such a strange way here so that you can actually see the width 
of the table or the width of this tree decomposition, the local tree width, <laughs> uh, you can actually see that here, okay? So number 17 has two neighbors, seven and six. Okay, so here I have to have a table after I've removed then 17 because it doesn't have any other interaction partner. I have a table with two rows and then I come to number seven. Um, and I still have to remember number six, but there come also two new nodes that are downstream here, which is five, the red string or the red rope here, and then number one, which I have to remember all the way until down until here and so on. So, so each, at each node, I also have a width, which is the, the set of the, the, the number of spins I have to remember at this node. And of course, uh, if I have a this... question. Sure. So Go it's ahead. Alex from the University of Oldenburg. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, your approach, isn't it actually uh, di um, a transfer matrix approach and the tree width tells you how large is basically the cross section. I mean, in normal transfer matrix, we have a line and the network is regular and basically yeah. do the same, but it somehow fluctuates the cross section, right? Yes, you can also, yes, maybe that's, well, now that you say it, it's maybe actually the, <laughs> the more digestible uh, way of putting it for the physicists. That's right, yes. Okay. Yes, and then, yes, and then it, sometimes these, these merge, these transfer matrices, no, at the, because we're not just going down a, down a line, but the tree is branching in, so yes. Right, so. That's maybe the actually the better way of explaining it. <laughs> Good, but anyway, um, so now you have the, um, um, and you see here the width of the, compared to the number of, of nodes in the network, the width is relatively low. So the worst thing that happens uh, is here for number two, um, where, you, where you have to remember five spins at once, so two to the power of 532 spin combinations, okay? Um, so that's the worst. And so we say that the Karate Club network has tree width five, or maybe if, if I haven't found the best one, it has a tree width that's lower. Okay, once, once you have this tree decomposition, it actually takes uh, on my laptop computer here one second to, uh, to compute the, the density of, of states. And then you can get everything um, from there. I mean, in particular, the, um, the partition function. And it takes uh, about, well, a few minutes maybe uh, to, to get uh, close to this or to get, the, um, uh, to get this tree decomposition. Of course, you need to first have that one. It doesn't fall <laughs> out of the out of the sky like this. Uh, but in principle, you can also um, um, do a slightly worse tree decomposition and then it takes slightly longer to, uh, for the things to, to compute. Okay, at least much far, I mean, you still you have an exact result and you have it much faster than the few hours computation time that we, that we guessed at the beginning, okay? Uh, now you can ask, can I, well, how do I get these tree decompositions then? Mm -hmm. So, because if I, <laughs> if I don't have that, uh, then um, I can't use the approach, right? So, um, and I want narrow tree decompositions. That is at, the, at each node, the, the table is, uh, contains just a few nodes so I can actually handle it. Um, because the length of the table is two to the power of the number of nodes. And um, <clears throat> so I, then I promised, I think in the abstract that I would also go into this uh, method for, um, for getting the tree decompositions, but I think it's too much for today. So I'm just saying I'm using simulated annealing and um, about the other details, you're welcome to, to ask me uh, now or later or anytime. And they're also in this, in this paper here in, in journal, journal of Physics Complexity. 
Good. So the message is um, uh, without a sophisticated method, by simply by simulated annealing, we can get uh, tree decompositions of uh, quite a number of um, real networks that are not too big, but also not too small, and that have been often used as as uh, as test networks. So, for instance, here you have the um, from, well, now I think it's already pretty old, but uh, for extracting from archive the, the authorship collaboration, uh, the, or the, yeah, the, the, the co-authorship network of, um, of network scientists, which has around 400 nodes and close to 1000 links. And then you have a tree with um, of eight. So instead of doing, two to the power of 379, you just have to uh, do roughly two to the power of eight. Okay, and that per node, so times, times this one, times this value, computational steps. Uh, sorry, Constantine? Yes. Could, could you tell what are the labels in the table? Because I, I don't understand the, this W2. Okay, sorry, yes, yes, okay. So, well, this is obviously the name of the network. And um, yes, now we just now just focused on this omega infinity. So that's uh, that's the maximum uh, width over the whole tree decomposition. Okay, so here it would be five because there's this node number two that has where you actually have to remember the spins of five nodes together. Okay, so that's uh, that's the maximum. And uh, what else do we have then? Then here is a kind of um, exponentially weighted average uh, here, the, not the, the, omega, uh, the W2, uh, which is a kind of more realistic estimate of the, of the computational effort because it's really uh, summing up over all the nodes two to the power of that width there. Okay, so it's summing up basically all the, uh, the length of the tables that I, that I have to process um, when, when solving that, when computing the, the partition function and, um, and then taking the logarithm of that. So this would be equal to that if they all had the same maximum width, but of course, typically it's, it's even lower. So, to, so computational effort is then number of nodes, which is this column here, times two to the power of this W2. Okay, then this is the number of links. And this is the, um, the bipartivity of the network, which I just showed here as a, as a simple application of the this, of this algorithm on. Yeah, it's, it's sorry to be that annoying, but I cannot see your mouse. So I-, I Ah, know. sorry. I'm, I'm okay. sorry. <laughs> okay, so- <laughs> I'm sorry. So W infinity is the maximum of uh, is the maximum width uh, inside a tree decomposition. W two is this weighted mm -hmm. okay. uh, width. Um, well, V is a set of nodes, so that's the cut also, that's the number of nodes, the cardinality of the node set. Likewise, here for L, that's uh, the number of edges, and then B is um, is the bipartivity. So that is um, uh, how many in a um, well, basically, the, the the energy of or the maximum energy I can I can reach, or how many um, how many edges of these can I put uh, between nodes in different spins? It's it's kind of solution of the maximum cut problem. Okay, but we don't we don't need to go into this here. So, but the Karate Club. Um, as the maximum energy, if you count the energy as the the number of edges between unlike spins, then you can at most put with 61 edges uh, between unlike spins. And that's the maximum cut. That's also an NP-complete problem in general. And uh, so it was just a kind of test application uh, for the for using these trees in the first place for something before I actually started to to uh, solve the 
the easing model completed. Okay. Thank you. Did I keep, yeah, okay. Any other questions? Because I apparently jumped into this table without explaining what it is. Good, so the, the main message is just, you can, uh, you find uh, without sophisticated methods, you find uh, for many networks, uh, you find a tree decomposition by, by simulated annealing simply. And then just uh, for, for some of these, I, I just computed the exact heat capacity. So I got the, I got the partition function and then um, the um, taking the second derivative and multiplying by beta squared, uh, then you get the heat capacity. And uh, yeah, it's just interesting that, okay, they have, they come in different shapes here for, for different sizes. So now you can, you have, when you extract the maximum here, you have kind you have now an exact estimate of where you, you would say that kind of the finite, finite version of the, of the transition point is, mm -hmm. so the maximum of the, um, of the heat, uh, of the heat capacity as a transition point. And, for example, this, this political books network, it's interesting that this is so much uh, smeared out here, so to speak. That's probably because of the strong community structure in that, in that network. Okay, so you can calculate these things or entropy or whatever you want for the easing model now exactly in, again, basically no no time. So the, the calculation in this, uh, this diagram summed up took, I think, uh, about half a minute on, on one core on my laptop here. <clears throat> Good. And then finally, back to the, to the example of the belief um, propagation on that network. So I took the network that Newman and co-authors used uh, um, to test their algorithm, I took that one also. Um, so that is actually so um, um, so sparse uh, that you don't even need um, simulated annealing for uh, for finding a reasonable tree approximation. You can just do gradient descent, and then so here it took about one second to find a reasonable tree, uh, tree decomposition and one second to, uh, to get these values um, for the entropy and for the, for the specific heat. Good. Then finally, I, uh, I should say that um, I didn't assume uh, that the couplings for this easing model that they were all equal or all positive or so. So the the, the same thing also works uh, with spin glasses. I just didn't put that in here because it um, makes things just more complicated, but you just plug in also your, your coupling matrix with positive and negative couplings and it just works the, the same way. Uh, we can also call, uh, calculate expected percolation cluster sizes and more things about uh, about percolation on these networks, including, for instance, the SIR model, which is basically just one percolation on a network. Um, you can also treat equilibrium properties of dime dimer um, uh, formation on networks. What I don't see yet is how it helps for non-equilibrium processes, for instance, for the SIS model. Um, or we can maybe discuss that. And now, of course, you could say, okay, now I've again defined a class where I can do things exact. And then probably I meet some networks where, it's, where I don't find a, um, a sufficiently narrow tree approximation so when the tree approximation is too broad, uh, so I would have to remember too many 
spin combinations at once in my tables, uh, then of course I can again do approximations from there and hopefully some controlled approximations where I can hopefully get some error bounds to know how precise they are. And um, finally, uh, one may be wondering what is the tree the relation between tree decompositions and, and community structure. When I started with this, I also thought, okay, now we have so many considerations of community structure, many algorithms to find the community structure, but what does it actually help for, um, for exploring the dynamics when I know that um, now I have decomposed the network into clusters where there's a lot of interaction inside a cluster and few outside a cluster, but I haven't seen um, algorithms that are actually not much work, let's say, that exploits community structure for, for computing something with the easing model or with, um, uh, with any other stochastic process on a network. All right, so that's, that's it for now. I hope you have some questions, comments. Thank you. Um, I have a question, Constantine. I, I don't know if it is trivial. I mean, you started with this um, tree structure and what you recover is the one dimensional um, icing model, right? The same partition function, as you said, it only mm -hmm. So there are there is no transition there for the one dimensional oh. icing model. Then you start adding some loops and you have uh, different uh, networks, different neural networks in which you do find the transition. Now, is there something like a minimum number of loops that, that you require to have a transition or no? I mean, um, I think it's already on a triangle. Uh, I think on one triangle, I mean, you would, I mean, the question is if you want to call that a transition, but I think you already have a max, isn't it? You have a maximum on of the heat capacity already on a, on a triangle. There's already, yes. Okay. There's already. We are also looking, we are only looking at fine. Well, a, a triangle is, is uh, okay, it's like a ring, right? Yeah. And, uh, well, then, then the question is how does the transition point scale with system size, right? Ah. What, 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 I'm, what I'm, I'm saying is if you have a one dimensional thing or a ring, in mm -hmm. the thermodynamic limit, there is no transition. You go to two dimensions, I mean, this is textbook, and you have the transition. Now, you are somehow in the middle, putting loops and, and whatever, and the question is, can, can one give a, a criterion for when the transition would occur in the thermodynamic limit? Well, I mean, okay, when it's 1D, so I just have this, like, here, Change of the yeah, there is no transition. Um, and I just take that to infinity, then there's no transition. Okay. Um, or, or the critical temperature is zero, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I do not remember. Right. I, I do not remember, but th there were results, for instance, in a Barabasi Albert network. And I don't know what happened with the transition as as, as n goes to infinity. Um, I mean, my general yes, question is: Is there a criteria? I don't know in terms of loops or in terms of something that breaks the one-dimensional geometry that gives uh, when the the transition uh, the phase transition would appear. Okay, I think my guess is now. Uh, that or well, maybe first to, to clarify more your your argument in, princi in principle you say okay these are just and when i have something like this here and it and it grows bigger and bigger but i still find a, a tree decomposition in principle i just have again a tree and locally it's it has some it's decorated with some loops mm -hmm. so that should be a, that should, should then also be equivalent to the one-dimensional case and make and if i make that 
um, if, if I um, take that to infinite size, when I still have this kind of um, tree decomposition, it's, it's again still equivalent to a 1D one, one system. Mm -hmm. So there shouldn't be a transition. Okay. And I guess... Hmm? So your guess is that if you, I mean, instead of taking a well-defined uh, uh, network, you take one that you can, I don't know, uh, a synthetic uh, network that you can construct and that you construct in the same way for different values of n. And if you take the limit of n going to infinity, it, it, you would say that there will be no transition. Yeah, that, that would be the, the hypothesis, but... Okay. Uh, Alex has the hand up, as far as I can see, Alex Hartmann. Yes, that's right. I have another question. Mm -hmm. So uh, is it known for erdish rainy random graphs how the tree width scales with the system size? Uh, probably, but... <laughs> um... Well, I don't know. I haven't. I haven't read it. So, okay. Uh, maybe because I, I just focused from the start on this, on this, uh, on this real networks. Yes. Yeah, I so mean, because... you love where you compare with the results from Newman and Al looks very nice. <laughs> so, I mean, your method apparently is uh, not bad. Yeah, I mean, it's. I mean, if I haven't uh, made a mistake, uh, it's it's exact. So it's there's no. Um, if I mean, if there's any discrepancy here between between the points, I mean, between these the positions of these circles that I have drawn and their black curves, then that has to be due to the finite precision of the Markov chain Monte Carlo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. So. I mean, I have just a comment on the previous question. I mean, when you look at a two-dimensional system um, and uh, if you keep the width of uh, so I have an aspect ratio and so have L times M, and if you keep the width a constant because the width is like the tree, tree width here, then mm -hmm. certainly if you make the length infinite, it will be one-dimensional again. So I guess a requirement is that the tree width has to grow with system size in yeah. order to make a thermodynamic transition. Uh, yes, I, I would also support that. So for, for instance, yes, and if you don't, if you have a, uh, if you have a square lattice and, um, uh, and you make it larger and larger in both directions, so square lattice L, L times L, and you let, let L grow, then, yeah, as you say, then the, then the tree width of that object uh, also grows, so. So if, in fact, for so which means for reproducing the result, the easing model results on 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 square lattices, this is not a this is not a suitable method because I don't as if I want to go large, then my tree width explodes with the linear dimension of the of the lattice. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Hey, Emilio, do you want to go next? Hi. I, Hi. Is there any difference between the three decompositions for planar and non-planar graphs? You know, in the invasive models and this kind of things, this, there is a, I mean, the three-dimensional easy model is quite different from the two-dimensional and, and the two-dimensional with external field is very different from the two-dimensional. So there is a fundamental difference in the partition function between planar, planar graphs and non-planar graphs. I don't know if this uh, shows up in the three decomposition. Oof. Uh, yeah, I can't. I can't even speculate. So, <laughs> um, well, what we just said is that even for uh, uh, for a for a 2D lattice, so if the if the um, network is really two dimensional in this sense, then uh, we we anyway have diverging tree width. So. Mm -hmm. If I kind of put just put a take my planar graph as a kind of perturbed square lattice, um, I don't think I have uh, I have a narrow tree decomposition for this. 
So the polarity is, is actually just just a, more like a hindrance to to having um, small tree width in general, I think. But um, again, I would so this means that that in general, three decompositions for for non planar grass, for example, for the for a three dimensional lattice, will be very difficult. Will be very so the, the trees will be very broad and all that. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Oh, sir? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Constantine, uh, uh, in principle, you have an arbitrary network that the composition in tree is not unique, as far as I understand. You no. can have several Euclidean compositions. Now, is there an optimal one? I mean, for instance, there is the minimum spanning tree on networks, which is the one that has the less uh, distance or the less weight on the nodes or whatever. In this case, is sort of a classifying measure for the different trees obtained and ones might be more efficient than others or doesn't really, is not that important whether you decompose in a given tree or use another one? Well, here this, uh, the thing with the minimum spanning tree, um, I don't have that hmm? because um, all the, all the, I mean, there are no weights on the on the edges, so all the all the spanning trees have the same, okay, the same weight. <laughs> um, okay. So it's more like uh, <laughs> it's really like, uh, yeah, finding these um, these path-like <laughs> um, arrangements with um, where the extra the non-path connections they stay kind of short so to speak so i don't have so many overlapping ones which would make my tables broad uh, and in fact it doesn't even have to i mean the tree decomposition doesn't even have to be um, a spanning tree so the optimal the, the optimal tree decomposition yeah. typically isn't so there are there are, there are typically some uh, some parts of the tree um, uh, let's see if I find some here. Well, where the where the tree would have an edge, but the the actual network doesn't. So mm -hmm. sometimes it's better to arrange it this way. So it doesn't even have to be one of your spanning trees. I see. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. Now I don't see that now. <laughs> there is one at least. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Javi, do you want to? Hello. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I had. Uh, so Ernesto, well, Ernesto was first. I think. Well, okay. okay. Do you mind? Well, yeah, I, I don't mind. I don't mind. No, it's just because it's related to what I really. Ah, uh, well, okay. Then go ahead. Yeah. So, yeah. Sorry. So it's about planar and non-planar graphs. So I think the the problem is is very interesting, and I think it possibly is not uh, such a clear division planar non-planar. So maybe non-planar need to be a split. So a graph is non-planar if you don't have an homomorphism with K5 or K33. However, in K33, which is a bipartite graph, you have a nice uh, position of the spin in the network, so because the graph is bipartite. But in K5, you don't have that. So possibly you can uh, split the networks, the, the non-planar networks into those which are homeomorphic to K5 and those which are non-homeomorphic to K33. And then maybe, I don't know, or maybe the, the homeomorphic to K33 behave more similar to the to the non plan sorry to the planar graphs than the other ones. So so maybe maybe you can say something for for non planar graph which is nice if you are able to do this subdivision. Okay, it just came to my mind about uh, planar graphs. So I have one planar graph construction that uh, is actually. Um, easy and uh, where where you have a which is actually a two tree so it's by definition uh, uh, you have two, uh, tree with two and what you just do is you start with one edge and then in every step you just add a node with two edges that go to the uh, to the two ends of an existing edge okay so we build it okay now there is only one edge so I have to take these two nodes now I can build a triangle over here and so you can so any any construction like this obviously leads to a um, a planar graph because there's always some space to put that extra triangle um, and this is also a two tree okay so um, 
I can just um, I can just get the the tree out of this. Um, well, now it's actually even just a line, but uh, I can make it branch by uh, putting one triangle here and one triangle here. Maybe I should use a different color for the tree. Then. Ah, okay. Now I should stop sharing the screen so everyone can see that. Maybe. Can you see my camera now? I mean my. Yes, yes we can see. Bit, bit too you, small, maybe. Yeah, well, if you okay. want to make it bigger, you can click on, like everybody can click on this, the, the rectangle corresponding to, to Constantine and then click on pin, right? Put a pin. Pin. Okay. And it turns it bigger, right? If you want. <laughs> okay, so that's actually the, the perfect example <laughs> and this is this is planar and it's 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 also a um, it's also a two tree i mean you can we can we can also uh we can also draw that in the way that we had uh we had before right so um i put some uh triangle here now then i have just have to in that line and that in that chain i just have to put connect not only to the next uh, no, but also to the one below. Okay, so then uh, comes something here. I put that here. Then I can uh, attach to this one. Um, yeah. Anyway, so to make it short, there are planar graphs with very narrow, um, with very narrow three D compositions. But probably, as we said, for the square lattice. Um, there are also some that are hopeless, so to speak. So, <laughs> uh, Javi, do you want to ask your question now? Uh, yes, yes, uh, um, yes. I, I, I would like to know uh, if there is like a, a metric to know if, if it, to apply this tree the composition is worth it or not. I was thinking like in these people that do the approximation, the tree approximation of a network to do analytical um, analytical computations of the spreading processes. And in general, there is no like a rigorous um, uh, discussion about the extent of this approximation. So I I is it the tree width or it is just that the network is sparse or? I didn't, uh, uh, can you repeat the yeah, sorry, like qu in, question? Uh, what, yeah. what is? <laughs> yeah, sorry, like if, if, the, if you try to do the tree decomposition in, in a network, it mm -hmm. comes that depending on the network, in depending on the network, it's not worth it to do it. No, like uh, maybe it is that you you have a lot of sums, and this is not you you don't you cannot um, pack together the sums. Let's say yeah, the tree decomposition is not narrow enough. So I... exactly, exactly. So mm -hmm. the, is there a metric that tells you if it is worth it or not to, to ah? Do? So like, you mean if like if, if I can just like the tree width or something like tells you or. Yes, yeah, so, well, there are some there are some lower bounds that you could. They are quite sophisticated, but I, I so I, I can point to the papers. Um, so there, these you could try, and then uh, on your network without actually trying to find the tree decomposition itself. And if that lower bound is already so high that uh, you say, okay, I, don't, I won't be able to do this, handle this computationally, then yes, then you can just drop it <laughs> uh, well or um, uh, or we find a way to to use um, a broad tree decomposition and then based but but then within that doing some approximations right as i mm -hmm, yeah. uh, as i indicated on the on the concluding slide so um, because that was the plan so to speak i mean so i just wanted to broaden a bit the the set of um of networks where we can do things still exact and then and then go from there okay so not to approximate too early and just say everything all i can do is exactly is trees <laughs> and not more but go a bit for a bit longer way um exact and then and then approximate right so this would be the next thing to try now so then of course still relatively broad tree uh, tree uh, decompositions could still be useful yeah. okay thank you can, can can i ask a question i'm not sure so hmm. 
Yeah. And I, I don't want to be so. This is clearly an important method on and this sort of useful for statistical physics and to characterize networks. What I don't understand, and that's a question for Newman as much as for you, is why this has to be presented on networks of dolphins or this karate network. I assume that the easing model on these networks is not intrinsically particularly interesting, right? So why does one need real to do this on real networks? So I would just present this on, well, on synthetic graphs, right? Or whatever graph, but what value is added by choosing a real network from dolphins or, or this karate club? Well, first of all, they, well, they present the, the actual challenge. And of course you can come up with all kinds of weird uh, synthetic networks um, that are somehow idealized or maybe you already have your method in mind and then you design them such that the method works nicely on them as was actually done in the in the paper by Newman also so they have a, a, a network construction that um, the um, where their method, where the uh, generalized belief propagation is to able to take into account exactly these these loops, these cycles that they generate there. So, okay, yes, but then yeah, but the, but the entropy of the easing model or the specific heat on these networks, I, I'm not sure. What, I mean, <laughs> that's expanding what the, I should make of this. Yeah, the right. theory and the understanding of of the of the and the. Um, the context of the of the objects that you, that we are dealing with, right? And so we are dealing with the easing model, and we're dealing with networks. Can I also comment on this? Yeah, sure. Okay, I also would say, I mean, there are many different quantities you want to calculate, and uh, like communities, whatever. And in principle, when you want to do it exactly, it's all basically the same type of algorithm. So if you can show that you can efficiently solve the Ising model, whether that's interesting quote or not, then you basically can solve all problems on such graphs. So other interesting questions will be able to be solved on such graphs if you are able to solve the Ising model efficiently. Okay, but well then it's a different story. Okay, well. Yeah, yeah, but for that, that you first case. have to do the, one, the first thing. You cannot do everything at once. So as I said, so for instance, now the, I can, without showing you that today, I can, I can do bond percolation. Probably, I can also move that over to to doing side percolation. That's relatively easy with this with this approach. I can I can do some other things where matchings form. I mean, so dimers on on these networks in equilibrium. And then I come to the point. Okay, now for something more practical. What about the SIS model? Can I? So now I don't have a partition function or anything. First of all, I would have to say what exactly do you actually want to uh, compute their average over what or <laughs> so, but uh, then it turns out that this is very much harder than uh, it seems than, than the other cases because it's non-equilibrium, yeah? truly non-equilibrium. Okay. okay so, so Ernesto, I think wants to comment on that. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, there are two things. At the end of the day, all of these spins are really artificial. And what you are trying to do is to characterize the structure of the network by having a toy model on it. So what, what he's doing at the end of the day is characterizing some properties of the network, which are very much related to the cyclicity uh, uh, intrinsic in certain kind of networks. So it's still non-transparent, but you absolutely can relate it, maybe the entropy or something like that with the clustering coefficient or other things, even analytically. This is on one side. So the, 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 I know that the many people believe that the, well, there, there are a spin there. But the, the second thing is that um, there are one kind of networks that are the sign networks in which you have signs over the edges. And these signs are, uh, for instance, uh, competition or cooperation between different uh, pairs of nodes or different agents in. Uh, in a, in a biological or in a social network. And uh, in this particular case, uh, people, for instance, there is a paper in PNAS uh, by Altafini and co-workers in which they use the icing model 
in order to find the energy functional by a Monte Carlo minimization and try to characterize the balance on the network. So in this particular scenario, this model absolutely can help there. And there is another, yet another one in which you can consider that again, though, if there are two spin off, uh, this particular scenario could be certain kind of they like to each other uh, or vice versa. And the spin down, you can assign this. So in some way, at the end of the day, what you are doing is characterizing the, the structure of the network. And then you are playing with uh, certain physical quantities. I call these physical metaphors because they are really not having a, a proper physical meaning in these uh, scenarios, but they can help to, to understand the structure of the, of the network. And of course, the dynamic at the constantly says so. Okay. Yeah, one broadening of this would also to be to apply it to network inference. Okay, so then, uh, so you observe correlations between nodes, you don't have the network, and then you try to infer the uh, the network from that, uh, making um, certain assumptions about the interactions. So, and then of course, in, in reality, probably uh, things also don't don't interact according to the easing model. But in order to get further with the with these inference methods, um, uh, you could also first simulate an easing model and then assume that you actually don't know the network on which you. Uh, on which you put it and then try to infer the network and then go on and uh, and go maybe to uh, more more difficult interactions right that that then would would occur in real in real data like i don't know correlations between gene expression etc okay so un unless there are any we were sort of at least 10 minutes over time by now right so and um, i realize that's my fault but uh, or partly but the, i think this was one of the longest discussion parts that we've had in uh, recently which is good right so are there any urgent questions that have to be asked now no well then thank you again constantine um, well thank you for and uh, thank you everybody participating for and for all the questions all the and discussion the and um right. I, I repeat if, if there are any volunteers for speakers for the next few weeks then uh, please let me know um okay thank you bye-bye okay thanks bye